Welcome to Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. This program is sponsored by some area churches of Christ and is dedicated to spreading the everlasting gospel as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. The churches of Christ accept the Scriptures as totally inspired of God and the all-sufficient guide for faith and practice. Therefore, they reject all doctrines of men and rely totally on the Bible to direct their course in serving God. It is our pledge to you that each lesson will be the truth as revealed in His Holy Word. Mr. Barnett carefully prepares the graphic so you can clearly see the book, chapter, and verse of each lesson taught. We urge you to either copy the scriptures used or record this program for further study. If you have any questions or comments, or if you need prayer, the Seeking the Lost ministry can be reached toll-free at 1-800-390-7734. It is our prayer that Seeking the Lost will be an important source of information about God's Word and will help you more perfectly worship Him. And now, here is Mr. Barnett. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in to the Seeking the Lost broadcast. I hope that you get some good out of it. I hope that there is something that you learn. If it's just one thing, then our time is well spent. There are many things that I need to learn about the Scriptures. After studying it for 50-odd years, you know, I find things every day that I did not know that was right there, right before my eyes. I'm sure that's the way that you are, and I know that you appreciate the scriptures. So let's study this particular subject today, and that is weighed in the balances and found wanting. You Bible readers already know where I get the text for today, and of course we go back to the book of Daniel. The scriptures tell us while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar, gave the command while he tasted the wine. Evidently, he was, he was at least half drunk, as we used to say down in Calumet, gave the command to bring the gold and the silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem. You know, that magnificent temple was destroyed when the people were carried away into captivity. And they carried away all of these gold and silver vessels. And here Nebuchadnezzar decides to show out even further because he had everybody there. He had a real shindig going. That the kings and his lords, his wives, notice that's plural, and his concubines, that's plural, might drink from them. You know, he had his own vessels there. But his fate is already sealed because you see the Medes and the Persians are outside the gates and they are diverting the river and they are diverting the river so that they can go under the bars that they had set there. They didn't put them all the way to the bottom. But in a way, and his concubines and his wives, his lords might drink. He really was showing out. And they drank wine. Look here. They praised the gods of gold, the vessels of, gold, of silver and of bronze. And they had gods of iron and gods of the wood and gods of stone. But there's something going to happen. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. You know, somebody would say, well, it scared me so mad it just sobered me up. Well, I don't know if it sobered him all the way up, but he's in a different mood. You can just hear the riotous laughter and yelling and hooping and hollering, drinking from the gold, silver vessels that came from the temple. Nebuchadnezzar had carried the people away in captivity. And God had told them that they would stay there 70 years. Actually, it was 50-something, but they spent about 20 years in captivity in their homeland. They rebelled, and God put them over there in Babylon. But anyway... Something has disturbed him 
to the utmost. Then the king's countenance changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his hips were loosed, and his knees knocked against each other. Now, he's in a bad way, isn't he? Have you ever wondered where that the expression came from, that my knees were knocking? Well, his literally were. Nebuchadnezzar, that uh, Belshazzar's knees were actually knocking together. He, you know, he uh, was drunk and hooping and hollering, and then all of a sudden, he sobered up, and he is so afraid because on the wall he saw a hand, just a hand, and that it was writing. Of course, you know what he did. He trotted in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Couldn't do it. Well, his wife came in and told him, or the queen came in, may have been his mother, but his, the, she told him of a man that had served his father, Nebuchadnezzar, that he was a person that could interpret dreams and riddles and things of that sort. A very wise man. Oh, he said, send for him. And so they sent for Daniel. What a surprise is coming. And this is the inscription that was written. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Euphrosyne. Well, who could, who could understand that to start with? But Daniel understood it. Now let's think about that. The scriptures tell us, Daniel said this is interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Actually, Belshazzar is not going to live through the night because they're going to complete the diversion of the Euphrates and it's going to flow away and expose the bars which didn't all the way go to the bottom. They're just going to come under it. And he's not going to live through the night. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. It's over. It's finished. And then take you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom has been divided, Perez, and given to the Medes and the Persians. The Medes and the Persians were partners in the invasion of Babylon. It was going to fall. And so there it was that here that Belshazzar, that he learned his fate. As I say, he did not make it through the night. Now then, I hope that this is plain enough because this is something from the hieroglyphics that was found in Egypt. Here you have a balance. In other words, a scale, what we would call a scale. And here they're weighing the heart. You know, Egypt's Book of the Dead spoke of the afterlife. And they said that they weighed the heart after a person died to see how he lived and see how he would fare in the afterlife. They would weigh the heart against the feather of truth. The feather of truth. And you can see here that they're weighing, and this Egyptian god is moving the weights to find out if he is going to be okay in the afterlife. But anyway, weighed in the balance. When they're talking about weighed in the balance, this wasn't called what we would call a scale. It was called a balance. Weighed in the balance, Belshazzar. And you're found wanting. Let's think about that a little bit. Put it to our own lives. Here is the real judgment, though, in the New Testament. You remember in Revelation... John wrote, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. I want you to notice that is in the plural. And another book was opened, and it tells us what it is, which is the book of life. 
And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. Does God keep a record? Of course. Somebody said, that's going to take a lot of paper. Paper won't be the record on which the record is written. But he'll keep a record. He does keep a record. He knows where you are this morning. Well, just think about this. That they're going to be judged with the things that are written in the books. And we're given the name of one book. And that, of course, is the book of life. Revelation 3. He that overcometh shall be clothed in white garments. I will not blot out him, his name, from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. One of those books which we talk about the book of life is a list of faithful Christians all over the world. Why not? He is capable and able to do those things. And I'm going to say this, that in the judgment, we need not think that we're going to have an opportunity to refute the charges. You see, it had already been settled. Here we have Adam and Eve in the garden, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the cool of the evening, and he says, where are you? I said, we were naked and we hid ourselves. Right then they convicted themselves because God said, who told you he was naked? He knew, and even beforehand for sure, because God knows, but they were convicted out of their own mouth. And so it will be on the day of judgment. You needn't think that you're going to get up there and argue your way through the so-called pearly gates. But anyway, he's got a book of life, evidently a list of faithful Christians all over the world. Yet now I will, if you will forgive their sin, this is Moses praying to God. And I put this in because it mentions this book way back in Moses' day. But if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. God said, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. In other words, you can forget that self-sacrificial notion because whoever is responsible is the one that will be blotted out of my book. But I put that in so that You know, that it's mentioned one or two more times in the scriptures, the book of life. Now then, think about this. Here is the real judgment of the New Testament. You know, the Egyptians weighed in a balance. And the dead were judged according to their works. This is the record of our deeds. But I say unto you that every idle word that men will speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment for by what your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. You think about that, myself, as a preacher. You know, I walk a very tight line. I've got to preach the everlasting gospel that it is written. If I fail by my prejudices or by my ignorance, then... That's going to be something against me in the afterlife, don't you think? You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. People use the faith only doctrine to avoid being baptized in water, to be immersed. But here he says a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Think about this, 2 Corinthians For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So one of those books is a record of our deeds, isn't it? Think about this. By the things which are written in the books... You know, we don't see the book of life. We don't see the record of our deeds. But what about this? The third book is the Bible. Yeah, 
the things that are written therein will be weighed in the balance, will be put on the scales of how we have obeyed that. And here is something to think about. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. What? For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. But he adds, he who rejects me and does not receive my words, that which judges him, the word which judges him, the word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And so we better pick up our Bible. We better read what the Holy Spirit has recorded from the lips of Jesus Christ from the apostles. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we have these books that will be opened. Now let's explore something else. I want you to think about that. Which way would the scales tip in this particular thing? And he said unto them, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Think about that for a moment. Somebody says, well, it looks pretty plain to me. How about no? You have denominational preachers this very morning, this is Sunday morning, that they'll be in the pulpit, and if this question comes up, they will scoff at the idea that you should be baptized. Well, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Just say the sinner's prayer. Now, you put this on one side of the balance or the scale, and you put this doctrine on the other. Which one do you think is going to be lighter? Well, of course, we know which one. Now, look at this. One church is as good as another. You've heard that all your life. So you are free to choose which denomination you want. Would it surprise you if I were to say there is not a single, not one, denomination mentioned in the New Testament or Old either? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, look at this. There is one body. We won't argue over that because I have a scripture to tell you what it is. And there's one spirit. Just as we called in one hope. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. There's one God. And Father of all. Who is above all. Through all. And in you all. Look at the ones up there. One body. One spirit. One hope. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God. And Father of all. Think about that. Think about this. And he is the head of the body. What is that now? There's one body. And he is the head of the body. What is the body? The church. Who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is the head of the body. If you ask yourself, what is the body? Well, the body is the church. One church as good as another, you put that on one side of the balance scale. Now see, which one is heavier, so to speak? Which one tips the scale? Think about this. The church does not matter. It won't get you anywhere. Whew, I'd hate to think about that in the judgment. The brother preaching that, but look here. Therefore, take heed unto yourselves. And to all the flock, this is talking to the elders of Ephesus. Paul had called them there. He knew he wasn't going to see them anymore. Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. One church, church doesn't matter. Jesus thought enough of it to buy it, to buy it with his own blood. Now, I'm not ever going to say this, and I think many of you do and maybe will 
through stubbornness, but I would watch that language. The church don't matter when he gave his precious life blood to buy it. He bought it. Acts 2, 4 to 7. Praising God and having favor with all the people. These are the people that heard the everlasting gospel for the first time after the resurrection of Christ. And the Lord added to the church daily. Seems like he's keeping up with that role, doesn't it? You know, you can't really join the church of Christ. You can obey the gospel and be added to this great body. But I don't guess it hurts a, a lot of things for people to get it in their mind. You join a certain group for a specific purpose, but you don't really join the church. You're added to it. And who does he add to it? Those who obey the everlasting gospel. Think about this. One church is good as another, and denominations are good. That's a lie. The devil told it. Paul said, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Are all the preachers this morning going to preach on the same thing, and are they going to have the same sermon? No. You'll get so many varieties, you won't know. You'll be totally confused that there be no divisions among you. You know, denomination means division. No, he said, I don't want that. These are these little many denominations that have picked up, that have popped up. For it has been declared unto me concerning you, my brethren, by those of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now I say to you, I am Paul, or some of you say, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, I am Cephas, and I have Christ. And he gives them some rhetorical questions. He said, is Christ divided? Now you just go down the line. You ask a person, of what affiliation are you religiously? The correct answer, I'm a Christian. But no, you'll hear the name of one denomination after the other. Why are we divided? Here we find that the Holy Spirit is inspiring Paul to write against that, and he says, Am I, is Christ divided? No. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Well, why are you wearing somebody else's name? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. Well, what's wrong with you folks over there in Corinth? that you're trying to have all of these divisions. And that's just in one congregation, not worldwide as it is today. There's over 30,000 denominations in the world today. Oh, here's something you better not touch on this. <clears throat> the LGBTQ movement is endorsed by God and he approves of their lifestyle. Really? Even the Pope in Rome recently endorsed them, saying everybody needs to love. What does the book say? Well, here's what it says. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards nor re, uh, revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. You put this on one side of the scale. See which way it tips when you lay this down. What about it? And then he said, and such were some of you, you Corinthians. But you are washed. In other words, they obeyed the gospel. But you are sanctified. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What about that? Hanging in the balance. It's not hanging in the balance. It's overloaded on the side of the Lord's word. Well, let's go on. There are many heads of the, and headquarters of the church. No? No, you put that on one side of the scale and see how you come out. Put this on the other. He hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, 
which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Put that on the other side of the balance scale and see how, what happens. And again, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is, is head of the church. He's the savior of the body. There's nowhere else, nobody anywhere else that says that you can be saved outside the body. Look at this. He is the head of the body, the church. Put that on there. You won't need but one of these scriptures who is beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Think about that. Which way will the scales tip? Now then, let's weigh all the man-made creeds. You know, every church has a creed. You shall not add to the word which I command you. Don't take from it either. Look here. Do not add to his word, Lord, lest he rebuke you. You'll be found alive. Look at this. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. Look at this. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecies of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will take away, will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. If anyone takes away from these, from the words, then God shall take away his part, oh, from the book of life. Be a good way to get expunged, wouldn't it? Man-made creeds, no. Just think about it. If you were put on the scales today, you know, all of us are going to be that way. If you are and I, I'll include myself, because as my age, I realize that I hadn't got as far to go as I've already come, that soon I'll be put on the scales, so to speak, figuratively speaking, of course. If you were put on the scales today, wanting, in other words, what it means by wanting, it means it's too light that the scale balance over here outweighs what we would be. Think about it. Time is gone. This is Earl Barnett and have a good day. You have been watching Seeking the Lost with Earl Barnett. If you need prayer or have comments or questions, feel free to call the Seeking the Lost ministry at 1-800-390-7734. That's toll free, 1-800-390-7734. Seeking the Lost is sponsored each week by some area churches of Christ. Until next time, may the good Lord bless you and keep you.